Good morning. I'm Chris. Uh, I'm from Rands. I'm uh, one of the uh, uh, original coders on Fawcett. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about like uh, why we've made it the way that it is, um, and what we're sort of thinking about doing in the future. Uh, I think I've got it's quite long, so. Um, we may run out of time for questions, but um, I think later in the day we're doing a, the dev workshop. I think we're planning to have a Q&A with the main devs. Um, so you can definitely ask me questions at that point. Um, so, and the other thing is I, I built the slide deck so that with the idea that it could, we could use it as a sort of temporary reference for people wanting to code uh, on Fawcett. So it's quite text heavy so that Hopefully, people can sort of look at the slides and, and get the uh, general gist of things. Um, so that's just a warning. Um, all right. So first part is, is sort of the philosophy that we're trying to adhere to. So our goal with Fawcett is to be the easiest production SDN controller in the world. It, it needs to be easy to deploy, uh, easy to operate, easy for someone who wants to come along and add a feature to add a feature, and easy for a network engineer to uh, support. And like, I'm a network engineer, not a software developer, or at least that's sort of how I thought, my, thought of myself when I started working on this. And so for me, it was important that, that you know, a network engineer who doesn't have a great deal of software experience can come in, get familiar with the code, uh, work out what's supposed to be happening, work out if something's going wrong, why it's going on, and also, you know, to contribute features. I mean, that's kind of the point of SDN, right, is that people can define their network and software. So, I mean, that's why we went with Python, uh, you know, and a lot of the decisions are about making it really easy to get your head around. Um, so, yeah, there's the, the why we went with Rio OpenFlow. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We, we have the philosophy that we'll, we'll do what OpenFlow allows us. Sometimes that can be a bit of a pain. Um, and yeah, we, we try to stick to the spec. And uh, all the testing is all built against OpenVSwitch. So it's not just the spec, it's also the parts of the spec that OpenVSwitch uh, supports. So it's not an OpenVSwitch, we can't really do it because we can't test it. Um, but, you know, above all, it's got to work, right? It's got to be something that this network engineer that, that is able to read the code and stuff would actually be willing to deploy in his network. So it's got to be reliable. They've got to be able to monitor it. It's got to, you know, it, it's not a case of throw out all your network and bring and force it. It's got to interoperate with your existing uh, uh, equipment. Um, right. So in order to make the code like really easy to understand, we, we try to keep it small. We're trying to only stick to the basics of what uh, what you need. We, we sort of, yeah, the, the, uh, the things in the data plane that you need in order to be able to build a network on top of it. So it's, um, we give you a fib, we don't like give you VRFs and such. Uh, and yeah, so that's, Keep the code execution path really easy to understand. Um, and also, like when something weird is happening in your network, you want to be sure that uh, it's, um, you, you, you know, the things that you don't want in your network. Like if, if you're only doing switching and you're not actually, actually doing any layer three, you don't want some sort of like tendrils of the light layer three code sneaking in and doing strange things to your layer two network. You, you want to be able to just go, this is what we're using. That's all I need to understand. Hopefully, everything else is um, not going to impact things for me. Um, but that being said, it's really hard to build a network without any protocols. So we've added a few. We're adding a few more. Um, but one of the goals when we add these things is to yeah keep them nice and modular so that uh, if you're not using them, you don't have to worry about them. Um, all right, so one of the one of the goals of decoupling, you know, your control plane and your uh, data plane is that if your control plane dies, 
uh, it doesn't break your network necessarily. So we use fail secure mode. This is uh, an open flow concept that means that when the controller goes away, the switch will just stay as it was and keep um, executing exactly as it had been. Um, so essentially, your controller can die, restart, whatever, you can upgrade it, and you shouldn't see much impact on your network. Um, one thing that will happen is that all the MAC addresses you've learned will time out. So gradually, your network will turn into a hub. Your switch will turn into a hub. But that's over the course of like five minutes. So, um, and you know, it's better than it breaking entirely and not forwarding anything. Um, yeah, and if you want more reliability, then uh, the idea is that you can just use two controllers. So at the moment, um, that's yeah, your mileage may vary. Uh, it's not. It's going to depend on uh, the switch that you're using and how they're handling that case, and. Um, you you may have to be you, you may have to do a little bit of extra work to get that going at the moment. It, it's not probably going to work out of the box for you, but we're working on it. And if you really want to see that feature, then uh, it's open source. You can totally dive in and uh, fix it. Right. So with this idea that the uh, the controller is uh, not necessarily reliable, what's going to happen is that um, we lose a lot of state. Right. So if there's state that's persistent, then it's in the config file. And everything else that we learn in the network, uh, we just assume that at any point we can lose it. You know, if there's any, if there's any question about are we still synchronized um, or, you know, the controller restarts, then it's just going to start from scratch and, and relearn everything or your next hop resolution and layer two learning. So uh, a controller, every time you reload the controller, there will be uh, an impact in, in forwarding behavior because you learn lose all the learn MAC addresses, but um, it's fairly minor. It, it, it learns that stuff pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, I mean, if we could make an entirely stateless network, we would because state is is kind of um, I, uh, it's it's almost yeah. If, if it's stateless, then it's pretty reliable, right? It's only when state can change, and unfortunately in the real world, state can change that you actually have to worry about reliability. Um, so yeah, we try to keep that to a minimum. Um, so, and one of the other points I wanted to make is that uh, when you have a, when you, when you add a new feature and you, you invent some way to configure that in the configuration file, and then someone deploys that, if you ever want to change how that's configured, then you're going to break that person's network, right? And this, you know, they're really paying attention. There's every chance they won't see that. They're going to wake up in the morning and say, oh, why is all of a sudden all my net VLANs disappeared from my network? That's not really something we want to do to people. But yeah, um, the thing about should is um, you can just substitute that for probably won't. Bear that in mind. OK, uh, so one of the important things about Fawcett that is, is kind of the obvious criticism that, that you have is that when you separate your controller and your data plane, then you've, there's more distance between them. There's sort of more, um, when, when you communicate on that, it, it, it's a less, it's, it's a longer, more complicated part. Um, right. And so that sort of, you can have this risk that, uh, you end up with too much on your control channel. So when you're getting network traffic and you're sending it along the control channel, remember that the control channel is the only thing you have that can say to your data plane, stop sending me all that traffic. Um, so if it's overwhelmed, then you, know, you can't actually stop it sometimes. Um, but unfortunately, the control plane does have to look at some packets. You know, we, we've got to learn MAC addresses. Uh, we've got to resolve next hops. Um, but we try to keep that to a minimum. Um, so the control channel is rate limited, but it's rate limited at the controller. And I, I think this is because Open vSwitch um, is not supported by metering, I think. Does not support open flow metering. That's great. It's yeah. In the next release. Great. <laughs> uh, because yeah, ideally that would be done on the switch. Um, uh, 
Right. But then the way that, because a lot of protocols do actually involve getting network traffic and sending them to the controller, uh, we need to be able to support that. And so what we'd like to do is um, effectively have a dark plane port on the switch that goes directly to your controller server. So this is not going through uh, the controller port. It does not need to take the slow path in OpenP switch or touch the CPU on your device. It will just be forwarded out a port as though it was data, and that port will then connect to the controller. Um, and then the controller can basically get as much traffic as it wants that way because it's not actually impacting its ability to communicate with the switch that's on a separate channel. Um, OpenFlow has this concept of auxiliary channels, uh, which is similar, but they still involve sending the traffic through the, um, the switch CPU. Um, and yeah, therefore, it's not actually necessarily going to solve the problem that, that we, we can see, right? You're still sharing a channel between your data plane uh, control traffic and your um, actual control traffic. All right. So the test suite is uh, pretty important to open for, uh, to force it. This is uh, what allows us to do our cyber RFPs. He's not paying attention. <laughs> uh, we have, yeah, the integration tests are pretty good. Um, quite often we call these uh, unit tests. Um, uh, so I think we need to be a bit clearer about what we call those. So the integration tests are the mini net tests that you can run against your switch. Uh, we also have some unit tests, and the unit tests are just trying to test Valve, or um, I, I'm not sure that we have any for Gauge at all yet, but there should be some. Um, uh, those need some improvement. So the integration tests, you're testing the whole system, uses mini net. Um, the focus is to get this like really thorough so that when you do your cyber RFP, you plug in your switch, you can be actually really confident that it's going to do what you want. Uh, problem with thoroughness is that it makes it really slow to run. Um, it's around 30 minutes. We like to uh, improve that, but I think the fact is that we're just going to keep adding more and more tests. And at some point, you know, we're just going to accept the fact that these are going to take a long time. Um, currently, it's we've got almost 8,000 lines of the um, integration tests, and we've got about 8,000 lines in the core code. It's pretty close. The core code's slightly ahead. Um, I think there's every possibility that integration tests could actually surpass that. Um, then the unit tests, well, the problem with the integration tests is that when you're doing development, and every time you like write a line of code and then test it, um, it that's half an hour. Now, you can break it down a little bit, but they're still very slow. So the idea with the unit tests is to have something that you can run really quickly make it really easy to write because the focus is just on, you know, helping development, not impeding it. Um, but at the moment, these are uh, not, these need work. Um, they're, they're not nearly, I, we don't have nearly enough coverage with the uh, unit tests at the moment. And there's a bit of shonky code in there that um, makes developing them pretty difficult uh, at times. All right. So then there's the plumbing, uh, how this all fits together. All right. So there's two parts to faucet. There's faucet and there's gauge. And this is because monitoring and control are separate functions. So faucet does your control, gauge your monitoring. And theoretically, gauge can monitor any OpenFlow 1.3 application. Um, I suspect I'm going to have need of writing it to support 1.0 to 1.5 at some point for my PhD. Um, so that's not really of any benefit to force it, but uh, that'll be an interesting thing, <laughs> perhaps. Um, and then within Fawcett, we've got Fawcett and Valve. So um, Valve is actually uh, the original project that we had that um, was a 1.0 open flow implementation that we just needed VLANs on a switch. So it was really quite trivial. Um, and then when we made Fawcett, we forked that, but it only did one data path. Um, so the idea was uh, Fawcett would sort of do the review interaction because we were anticipating the fact that we might want to use a different controller other than review in the future. Um, 
Whereas Valve, you've got, it, it controls the forwarding logic for, for one dark path. And it uses the Ryu lib, but otherwise it, it doesn't really have much interaction with Ryu. Um, right, and then on the gauge side, we've got a similar concept. So we've got the watcher, which is, um, this is uh, one of those situations where you've got this metaphor of a faucet, and then you try to stretch it, and you eventually come to a point where it, it, it no longer works. And uh, that's why it's called a watcher. Uh, <laughs> the idea that this is the person watching the gauge, it's, it's a bad name. Um, anyway, it, it's a similar structure, right? So gauge interacts with Ryu. Uh, watcher, I believe, has a little bit more interaction with Ryu, but um, uh, it, it is the logic for monitoring a single statistic on a single data path. So there's actually, um, this is a little bit different to how it looks in the config where you define a watcher for, and you can give it a number of data paths, but what happens internally is that it builds a watcher object for each of those. Um, right, and then the pipeline. So uh, I think uh, Ben actually went through this pretty well. Um, so just to refresh your memory, port ACL, this is ACLs on a port by port basis. Then the VLAN table will assign VLANs according, uh, check that your, your packet is um, correctly tagged, and then assign any VLAN tags on uh, access ports. Uh, the VLAN ACL table, so you can have ACLs per VLAN. Uh, the VLAN table can either port it to there, or if the VLAN has no ACLs, it will send it directly to the uh, Ethernet source table. Ethernet source table uh, is for identifying packets that are where we've already learned the um, Ethernet source address. So if we haven't already learned the Ethernet source address, it'll send it to the controller and forward it on to the next table. Um, if we have learned the Ethernet source address, then we just forward it on to the next table. So this table is quite overloaded. It does a few other things. It identifies packets uh, addressed to the MAC address of, um, uh, of, of any router that we have on that VLAN, um, and it will send those to the FIB. Uh, it sends up to the VIP table. Uh, it also filters out um, some Bogon packets, things we don't want to forward, like CDP, uh, CDP LLZP, spanning tree, I think, or, and anything with a um, broadcast source, which should probably be a multicast source, but we just haven't done that yet. Um, and yeah, it goes on. The, the V4 FIB and the V6 FIB, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, the, the key thing about them is that they do not, um, they don't output, they instead send it to the Ethernet destination table, which does all the outputting. Uh, the VIP table, this is for packets directed to the control plane, so it will filter those pretty uh, heavily um, and either allow them through to the control plane or um, not. Uh, and then uh, the Ethernet destination table, obviously, for the MAC addresses that we've learnt, um, it, it uh, outputs them if we know them, otherwise it will send them onto the flood table. And then the flood table has a whole stack of rules for forwarding packets. So uh, a couple of things. So there's a, one of the challenges that we have is synchronizing the Ethernet source and the Ethernet destination tables. Um, unfortunately, they're in a separate table, and we can get into trouble when these two things get out of sync. Um, so that's something we do have to be very aware of. Um, and then the flood table, as um, uh, been pointed out yesterday, uh, that could actually be um, tidied up a bit. I, I think, you know, there's been, uh, it's suggested that there's a bit of ambiguity about what the forwarding behavior should be when you try to forward a packet out the port that it arrived on, but I think the intention in the OpenFlow specification is pretty clear that you should not do that, um, but we have some vendors that do, so uh, we've worked around that. It's not it's not a huge deal, but I think it would be a bit tidier to do it um, uh, with just one rule per VLAN as opposed to one rule per, per VLAN. Um, 
And then some of the ideas for the future of things that we'd like to work on. As I mentioned before, um, uh, yeah, the high availability is, I, I believe you could make it work at the moment, but um, I believe it should be easier to make it work. Um, so the ideal for me would be that the switch just talks to one of its controllers, and then when it can no longer talk to that one, it flips over and talks to the other one. So it can do this as a, I'm going to talk to you and send you all the information that I need, but I'm going to ignore all of your commands. Um, or it could even just do it as a, I, I, I don't connect to you at all until this one fails, or fails and then I'll connect to you. Um, that would be great. That would work really well with the faucet model. But um, unfortunately, the uh, spit um, says that the controller should tell the switch who is master, not vice versa, which makes the whole process, I think, a whole lot more difficult. Um, but that's something I think we'll have to live with. Um, yeah, an API. So this is something we kind of, people talk about a lot, but um, we haven't really come to much of a consensus about how, how we should be doing this. So one of the key is that we don't, uh, introduce this whole new class of state of what are we talking to northbound? Is it still there? What has that said to us? Um, is Are we synchronized with that? Um, I, I, I mean, my, my vague feeling at the moment is, is that, you know, when you, when you send anything northward, it's information and you broadcast it to everyone. So everything north of you has the same viewpoint. And then anything that comes southbound, um, is a command and it's item potent. And uh, by that, I mean, it, it, uh, when you get, like, if you got five of these commands, they would be exactly the same, and you would do the first one and ignore all the uh, following ones because it would be telling you to do exactly the same thing. So, so imagine uh, the difference between increase this number by one or set this number to three, right? If you increase it by one and you get the command five times, you end up with eight some other thing. Whereas, um, you know, if it's set it to three and you get that five times, it's set to three, you'll still need to probably choose a master out of those, but um, it shouldn't really make a difference. Um, yeah, because your controllers well, or everything northbound of you uh, should, uh, sh should effectively have the same viewpoint and should agree, but again, probably won't. Uh, and then virtualization. I uh, pointed out yesterday, again, that our, our routing per VLAN is not especially efficient. And uh, we'd like to move to using metadata internally to do some of this uh, classification rather than using uh, uh, VLANs, which is what we're doing at the moment. Um, yeah. All right. I got through that fairly quickly. All right. So that's the... Um, the, the core part of my presentation, I have about 20 bonus slides, but um, I think I might come back to those later since we're running a bit late already. Um, yeah, and I think for questions, we have the uh, uh, um, developer Q&A later on, and I think that would be a, a good time to do that. All right, thank you. Thanks. Um, and your observation, I, I understand why you chafe at 30 minutes as a long time for tests to run. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I compare it to six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's not so much chafing, it's just that when, when it's, it's not, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it, it is there for one reason, and then we need tests for yeah. the other reason, which is development. Your, your, your dichotomy of integration and versus unit testing is spot on. Yeah. Integration tests should take as long as they need to take. For sure. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.